Um, continuing with our string of awesome uh, local speakers, uh, Dr. Ryan Allen, um, I saw earlier, so I know he's... Oh, yes, getting you guys ready for the post-break excitement. You will be hearing from Dr. Ryan Allen after the break. Enjoy your break. And then we have music. We have uh, the quiz. Are we doing the quiz right now? Okay, let's do the quiz. Sorry. It does say right there in the program break. Okay, we are right on time. Good job, everybody. Um, this is the real deal for Ryan Allen, Dr. Ryan Allen from SFU. Thank you, Ryan. Um, as you can see in the program, uh, Ryan comes to this talk with exactly the right expertise. I'm very excited for this because I think, honestly, this question of uh, HEPA filters and kind of how optimistic we should be, I'm sure you're going to talk about the good and the bad and the ugly of them. Uh, it's a really important ongoing topic. Thank you for taking it on, Ryan, and the floor is yours. Um, okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Chris, for, for both introductions. Um, I was a little bit concerned, actually, when you introduced me before the break that I was going to come back from the break to an empty room, so thanks, all of you, for, um, <clears throat> thanks for being here, and thanks for sticking it out. I know that the, at this point of the day, the PowerPoint fatigue starts to set in, so hopefully we can do this as uh, pain-free as possible. Um, so this is actually the uh, kind of the placeholder title that I was given, and I actually decided just to keep it because I think it's kind of a reasonable way to think about um, HEPA filter air cleaners, are they a Band-Aid or are they a long-term solution? The answer is probably that they're both. Um, so I'm going to talk about HEPA air cleaners, and I have to disclose that I have um, received in-kind in support in the form of discounted air cleaners from a, an air cleaner manufacturer for use in my research. Um, they didn't have anything to do with the research, but they uh, sold us the air cleaners at a discounted rate. And I am absolutely not recommending or advocating for any particular brand or make or model of air cleaner in this talk. Um, so I kind of couldn't decide what I wanted to talk about, so I kind of just decided to talk about everything. Um, so this is the overview. I want to make a few introductory comments, which I can probably speed through, because I think with this audience, um, most of these things are probably pretty well understood, particularly some of these things have already been touched on today. And then I want to I make a few sort of big picture comments about where air cleaners and kind of household level intervention, interventions fit in relative to the suite of other things we might do to control air quality and talk about why we might want to intervene at the household level. And then try to summarize, briefly summarize the research on whether these things provide benefits in terms of exposure reductions in health. And I'll say a little bit about um, my own work in that. Um, and then, um, as, as, as Chris said, I'll also talk about some of the downsides or drawbacks of using these things. And one of the, one of the drawbacks is potentially the cost. And so that'll lead into a little bit at the end about cost uh, DIY air cleaners and then a little bit on cost um, effectiveness. So um, just to absolutely beat this point to death, I think this has come up a couple times um, already today. Um, it came up, I think, in Dr. Nazaroff's talk, and then um, Eric mentioned it a, a little bit as well. Um, we spend most of our time indoors, as we know, and most of that indoor time is actually in our residences. Um, particles in the PM 2.5's distribution readily make their way indoors. So these box plots are from a study I was involved with in the U.S. where we estimated infiltration efficiencies in 500 and something homes uh, kind of spread across the U.S. And in that study, the average infiltration efficiency was about 0.6. So 0 0.5, 0 0.6 is a reasonable kind of approximation of the central, te central tendency uh, of infiltration. And when you put those two ideas together, what you end up with um, as has already been said, is that a lot of our exposure to outdoor generated pollution actually occurs while we're indoors. This table or these numbers come from an analysis that actually used our infiltration um, estimates um, and some time location data to figure out where people are exposed and actually where exposure occurs that we can attribute health effects to. Um, and for a lot of people, and under very plausible scenarios, actually the majority of exposure to outdoor generated uh, PM 2.5 occurs when we're indoors. And that's important, and that's really relevant to what I want to talk about, because um, indoor air cleaner, cleaners can reduce exposure and potentially health effects to particles of indoor and outdoor origin. And I think, um, kind of as I'll say when I get to the research, I think in the early days, air cleaners were really thought of primarily as an intervention for 
indoor sources of air pollution, bioaerosols, um, asthma triggers, and it's really been relatively recently that we in the more sort of outdoor air, uh, air quality community have started to embrace these as a potentially useful intervention. So as probably everybody knows, um, when we talk about mechanical filtration, there are sort of two ways we can do this, and I'm going to talk about mechanical filtration, that is capturing particles um, on a filter medium. I'm not going to talk about other forms of particle capture, like electrostatic precipitators or ion generators. Um, the two approaches we have are to put it in the um, HVAC system, um, and these filters, as you know, are characterized based on the minimum efficiency reporting value, or MERV. Um, the advantage of that approach is that you can kind of distribute clean air um, throughout a dwelling or throughout a building, um, but there are some downsides. Um, many, uh, uh, certainly residential HVAC systems aren't equipped to handle the physically larger filters, uh, the phys lar physically larger size of a filter with a higher MERV rating. Um, the higher, more efficient filters may put more strain on the system. And probably the biggest limitation of induct uh, approaches to air filtration is that, in, at least in residential settings, the HVAC system is only in operation about 20% of the time on average. So it's only doing good when, when air is passing through it, and air is only passing through it uh, roughly 20% of the time. Um, the other approach, which is really more what I'm going to talk about today, are portable um, air cleaners, typically with a HEPA filter um, inside of them. These are characterized by the clean air delivery rate, which is kind of a measure of how much clean air um, the unit can provide, and they come in all sorts of sizes and shapes and, um, and configurations. But basically, the bigger the space, the bigger the volume of air that you're trying to filter, you either need more units or you need a unit with a higher um, clean air um, delivery rate. And then these clean air delivery rates are characterized based on different um, particle sizes, different, different parts of the particle size um, uh, distribution. So a HEPA filter is a high efficiency particulate air or high efficiency particulate arresting um, filter. So this figure shows removal efficiency for uh, different particle sizes um, for different filters. So I haven't sort of put all the different uh, MERV type filters on here, but you can see MERV 5, MERV 8, um, and so on. All of these you can see have sort of a U-shape. Um, with a minimum efficiency of around 0.2 or 0.3 microns. So those are the hardest uh, particles to capture. Smaller particles we do pretty well, larger particles we do pretty well, but it's that kind of middle range where particles are more difficult to capture. Um, so you can see that sort of U-shape appears for all of them. Um, HEPA filters actually have the same U-shape, it just doesn't really show up in the figure. Um, but the point is HEPA filters have a very high level of, of particle capture, even at those particle sizes that are relatively difficult um, to capture. Uh, the other point I'll make here is that there, I guess, technically is a distinction. HEPA is kind of a functional definition. It's a filter that achieves a certain filtration at that difficult uh, size range. I don't really tend to make a huge distinction between, say, a MERV 15 or 16 filter and a HEPA filter. MERV 16, I guess, technically isn't a HEPA filter, but it's pretty damn close, and it, it really isn't a, 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 an important distinction um, for kind of practical reasons. The US EPA and others recommend that people who are kind of concerned about air quality and want to use a more efficient filter use uh, like MERV 13 or above. Um, so the, uh, I think the last kind of introductory point I want to make um, is uh, to kind of clear up a, a common misconception that I hear, and this probably isn't a misconception that's held by people in this room, but I, I hear this a lot, so I just thought I'd mention it. That is that efficiency and effectiveness are not the same thing. So efficiency refers to um, kind of how many particles that a filter encounters will it capture, right? Um, and this is really just a function of the properties of the filter and the particle size distribution primarily. Um, and so as we saw on the previous slide, you know, a HEPA filter would capture, you know, 99 plus percent of the particles that it encounters. That is not the same thing though as effectiveness. So effectiveness or the amount that we can reduce PM2.5 concentrations in a space, that's a function of the filter itself, but it's also a function of the volume of air that comes through the air cleaner, the, the volume of air that you need to clean, and the air exchange rate. So you can have a very efficient filter. You can have a filter that's capturing 99% of the particles it sees, but it might only be reducing PM2.5 concentrations by 10% if that air cleaner is in a very small air cleaner in a very big room and windows and doors are open. So we have to distinguish between efficiency and effectiveness. Okay, so now I want to go kind of big picture and I want to think about um, sort of 
where air cleaners, what I, what I refer to as kind of household level interventions, fit in in the broader suite of options for reducing exposure and mitigating health risks. So this is kind of my overly simplistic way of thinking about how air quality links with health. I kind of think of it as like a chain of events, right? So pollution is re released into the environment. It moves through the environment. Maybe it dilutes, maybe it reacts, whatever it does. It eventually encounters a human being or a human being encounters it, that's exposure. The human being breathes some of it in and then that may or may not lead to some adverse health effect. So each of these kind of chains in this, or each of the links in this chain represents kind of a point where we can um, intervene. So we might want to reduce emissions. We might go, want to go to the source and uh, intervene that way. We might want to intervene along the kind of pathway and think about, um, you know, diluting the pollution by building a taller smokestack or something, or or building schools uh, farther away from major roads. Um, we might recommend the use of air cleaners, we might encourage people to wear masks, or after people get sick, we might do some kind of medical intervention to um, treat that um, disease or disability. Um, if we sort of put the medical intervention to the side, though, and kind of think about this continuum of intervention strategies to reduce exposure, I would argue that they sort of do fall on a continuum, whereas we move from left to right, um, the population that can benefit is getting smaller, um, the burden on individuals is getting bigger, and the cost of effectiveness is probably going down. Um, so if we clean up the, if we, if we reduce emissions, kind of everybody in that community benefits. They don't really have to do anything, um, typically, and it's pretty cost effective. One of the more effective ways to improve uh, the health of a population is to clean up the air that they breathe. Um, Fewer people are going to benefit when we inter intervene on the in individual or household level. It's going to place more uh, burden on people to change their behavior. And the cost effectiveness is, is pretty variable, I think, but is almost certainly going to be less than intervening at the source. So why do we want to intervene at the household level? I think the most effective exposure control strategy is always going to be to reduce emissions. So why would we want to intervene at the household level? These are sort of my three reasons that I always have in the back of my mind, and some of this a little bit probably reflects my own bias as somebody who does less work in Canada and British Columbia and does more work in places that are very highly polluted, um, sort of like BC during wildfire smoke, except all the time. Um, so I would argue that probably the three reasons why we might want to intervene at the household level are because A, uh, or I guess one, emissions reductions take a long time. Two, the benefits are unevenly distributed when emissions reductions do occur. And three, the kind of elephant in the room is just sometimes we can't reduce emissions at all. So um, as people in this room know, air quality in places like Canada and other high income countries has improved quite dramatically since say like the 1970s, um, in part because of really effective uh, legislation around air quality. Um, but even though we've been successful, the progress has been kind of slow and steady. Um, so this is one paper, for example, that estimated over about a 35 year period, PM 2.5 concentrations, kind of populated weighted average PM 2.5 concentrations in North America have declined by about a third of a microgram per year. Um, so that's sort of where pollution is already declining, but there of course are a lot of places in the world where it's not, it's stagnant or is still even going up. And so, you know, if you're a, if you're, a, um, if you're pregnant or you have a young child and you live in these places and people are saying, well, just wait for emissions to come down, that's not a very satisfying thing to hear because emissions probably are going to be high for the next 50 years or something. Um, and so uh, one area or one reason why we might want to intervene at the household level is because it takes a very long time for emissions reductions to take effect. And so this would be an example of the sort of Band-Aid scenario in my title. Another kind of band-aid scenario for air cleaners is that even when emissions reductions do occur, they don't um, kind of benefit everyone equally. This figure is a little bit complicated, but it basically depicts two things. Over a 20-year period or something, it depicts reductions in PM 2.5 in the U.S. and um, relative disparities between racial and ethnic groups in PM 2.5 exposure. And essentially, the, the lines represent at different thresholds the number of people living in areas with PM 2.5 above different levels. I think it's like 8, 10, and 12 micrograms per cubic meter. And the sort of take home message here is that as PM 2.5 has come down, the relative disparities between racial and ethnic groups and between income groups has actually gone up. So the point they make in the paper is that PM 2.5 reductions have not benefited all areas 
areas equally and more targeted PM 2.5 reductions are necessary. The kind of implication I think in the paper is that those more targeted PM 2.5 reductions should come from source control, but it's worth pondering whether household interventions like air cleaners might also help us achieve some of the more, more targeted uh, uh, reductions to help um, uh, members of the community that may be benefiting less from these emissions reductions. And then third, which I think is kind of, we're all aware of this, this is kind of the elephant in the room, um, is that sometimes we can't reduce emissions. And I think in a lot of ways forest fire smoke is really sort of a game changer in, times, in terms of how we think about um, air pollution. And I think one way that it is a game changer is this. So I think those of us in the research community are kind of used to like just pointing out the problems and then someone else will fix it, right? The Health Canada or the Ministry of Environment or Metro Vancouver or the US EPA will like go to the source and fix it. We can't do that obviously with forest fire smoke. So our interventions, we're sort of limited to interventions at the household or individual um, level. Um, and so this is really, so the, the Band-Aid or long-term solution, I think this is really where air cleaners are likely to be part of the toolbox, the intervention toolbox for a very long time for the foreseeable future. Okay, so that was kind of a very long and winding intro. Um, so now I wanna kind of start to summarize some of the um, research and what it tells us about um, air filtration and the potential benefits on exposure um, and on health. So um, this is a 2021 review paper that summarized, I think, 20 um, randomized studies uh, where um, people received both the air cleaner at one point in time and no air cleaner or sham air filtration at another time, and we can compare uh, uh, the indoor PM 2.5 concentrations during um, both conditions. So there are 20 studies I think listed here. Um, I kind of am going to throw out a couple of them. One was in a classroom. That's also relevant information, but it makes for a, a more difficult comparison. And one used uh, different technology. It used an ionizer rather than a physical filter. So if we toss those two to the side for the moment, we're left with 18 studies. And in those 18 studies, the average PM 2.5 reduction was 52%. But you can see quite a wide range from 11 percent to 82 percent and that's really relates to that thing I said earlier about how um, effectiveness and efficiency are not the same thing I think that range largely reflect, reflects how these things are used um, and you know the, the clean air delivery rate relative to the size of the, of the space and how often the, how often they're run and, and those sorts of considerations but at this point I would say that the evidence is pretty clear that these things do reduce exposure uh, in a pretty uh, meaningful way the other thing I should point out though is that these are with very few exceptions these tend to be short-term studies so these studies tend to evaluate PM or, um, air quality uh, what's the word uh, air purifier use over a relatively short period of time so days to a couple of weeks so that, I think, is a, is a limitation in our understanding of how beneficial these things are likely to be. The other thing that we have to keep in mind is that, in, that concentrations are not the same thing as exposure, right? So what I was showing you in the previous slide are reductions in indoor PM 2.5 concentrations. Um, most studies that have evaluated air cleaners have not made personal exposure measurements. They've just made um, indoor and sometimes outdoor concentration measurements. The few studies that have made personal exposure measurements um, seem to indicate that reductions in personal exposure are considerably lower than reductions in indoor concentrations. And that kind of makes sense because people aren't spending 100% of their time sitting next to the air cleaner. The air cleaner is only reducing exposure when you're in the space where it's cleaning the air. When you go somewhere else, that air cleaner is no longer benefiting you. It's no longer reducing your exposure. So this is just one kind of example of a, of a, of a small number of studies that have done this. In this case, it was 43 children with asthma in suburban Shanghai, so a relative high pollution environment um, and they put HEPA filters or sham filters um, in the bedrooms of these kids um, and they saw a 68% reduction with filtration in indoor PM 2.5 concentration but only a 27% reduction in personal exposure. Now 27% reduction is still better than zero but it's a lot less than 68% again because these kids are spending time um, in other environments. So we have to keep that in mind that one of the limitations of these things is that they only benefit you when you're in the space where they are operating. Um, okay. So, um, so when we think about health, this is kind of my um, probably oversimplified um, assessment of the literature. So before about 2008, there were people who were studying the benefits of using HEPA filters, but they were primarily focused on um, asthma triggers, um, uh, 
um, biological pollutants, tobacco smoke, those kinds of things, more sort of traditional indoor um, um, pollutants. And it's only been probably in the last 15 to 20 years that people have started, and particularly the research community, has started to embrace these things and started to evaluate their benefits in terms of mitigating the impacts from outdoor PM sources like uh, residential wood smoke, wildfire smoke, traffic-related air pollution, those kinds of things. These studies have almost exclusively, again, been short-term studies of HEPA filter use, so a few days to maybe a couple of weeks. And they've almost exclusively evaluated what I would call kind of subclinical or preclinical health outcomes. So subtle changes in markers that may indicate risk but aren't really um, sort of a clinical outcome. Things like uh, markers of systemic inflammation, um, small uh, subtle changes in lung function, um, blood vessel functioning, those kinds of things. And these studies have, again, almost exclusively used this kind of random, random um, uh, crossover, randomized crossover design, where basically everybody gets the intervention condition and everybody gets the control condition. What's randomized is the order in which you get them. And this is a really useful and powerful study design because essentially then every individual acts, or his, acts as his or her own control. So you're kind of comparing individuals to themselves. Um, and it, it helps us to kind of account for and eliminate the influence of a lot of other factors. This, um, this literature has really kind of exploded to a large extent in, say, the last five or six years. So these are screenshots of four review papers or meta-analyses that were published just since like 2021 or 2022, kind of um, summarizing the, the research in this area. And these are useful because now we don't have to rely on kind of individual studies, but we can start to see kind of collectively what does the research tell us um, sort of overall. And my read of the literature is that the strongest evidence um, uh, from, of, of health benefits from the use of um, air purifiers is for systolic blood pressure. The results are uh, reasonably consistent. So if you look in this graph, sort of each line represents an individual study, and you can see the, the effect estimates are graphed there, and they're reasonably consistent across studies. And then at the bottom there, which you can just barely see, is the little diamond, which is the sort of overall or pooled estimate of effect. And they estimate about a 2% decrease in systolic blood pressure uh, with the use of filtration compared to um, not using filtration. So that's probably the, the outcome for which there's the strongest evidence. So there's suggestive evidence for a whole suite of other outcomes that's maybe not quite as strong. Inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein or IL-6, uh, blood vessel function or endoth endothelial function, that's something we've actually seen in some of the studies that we've done, and some, some subtle but, but potentially meaningful differences in measures of, of, of lung function um, as well. So um, the, 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 I would say that the exposure evidence is kind of a slam dunk at this, at this point. We know that these things reduce exposure. The health evidence, I would say, is not quite as strong, not quite as unequivocal, but uh, reasonably good evidence of kind of subtle shifts in health when we um, reduce PM concentrations using, um, using filters. Now, um, as I have alluded to a couple of times, most of these studies were short-term studies focused on kind of days to weeks of, um, of, of filtration. Um, and I don't want to kind of shamelessly plug my own work, but we have been doing this so-called UGAR study for the last several years, and it's one of the few studies that has evaluated kind of the exposure and health benefits of longer-term um, HEPA filter use. Um, so we conducted the study in um, Ulaanbaatar, the capital city of Mongolia. So Ugar is a Mongolian word for like dirty or polluted air. Um, we on the organizing committee were really worried about overlap between speakers, but I'm pretty sure I'm the only person that's going to talk about Mongolia um, today. Um, so we did the study in, in Ulaanbaatar, which is, which is a, a quite a polluted place at the time that we uh, did this study, the annual average PM 2.5 concentration was about 70 or 75 micrograms per cubic meter in the city center, more higher in other uh, parts of the community. Um, so this is a single blind randomized control trial of uh, HEPA filter use during pregnancy. And our sort of thinking or our kind of rationale here was the idea that we probably can't, you know, you're not with an air cleaner going to prevent cancer or cardiovascular disease, something that, that d develops after maybe years or decades of exposure but that pregnancy potentially represents a really kind of well-defined discrete time where reducing exposure might have kind of disproportionate benefits in terms of the child's developmental traje trajectory. So that's sort of the rationale. So we enrolled um, 
540 non-smoking pregnant women. Um, we randomized them to either receive or not receive a portable air cleaner to use during their pregnancy. The initial phase of the study was focused on birth weight as kind of a crude indicator of fetal growth. And then we since have been following the kids um, as they grow up. We're actually still following. They're about between eight and nine years old now. I'm going to talk about results uh, up until when the kids are about four years old um, today. So this is everything I'm going to say in the next few minutes is work that other people did. I actually did very little. Um, this is work that was done by Prabhjit Barn, who is here uh, uh, somewhere as part of her PhD. Um, so we measured PM 2.5 concentrations for seven days in every participant's home at two times. Once early in pregnancy, kind of right after the air cleaner was deployed at an average of about 10 weeks gestation, and then again later at about 30 weeks gestation on average. Um, so this is kind of pooling all those seven-day uh, measurements together. And we saw about a 29% reduction in PM 2.5, but given the levels in, in this setting, um, a 29% reduction in absolute terms represents a relatively large uh, reduction in um, PM 2.5. Um, when, we, when we look at that by sort of time, um, uh, measuring PM 2.5 kind of right after the air cleaners de are deployed versus several months after use, we see very clear differences. So right after the air cleaners were deployed, people were kind of excited about using them, and we saw about a 40% reduction in PM 2.5. We went back five months later and did kind of the same measurements, and the reduction in intervention homes relative to control homes was only about 15%. And this is something that has been seen in other studies that have looked at long-term use. There is such a thing, I think, as air cleaner fatigue. Um, people are concerned about noise, people are concerned about electricity costs. Uh, we didn't track these things as kind of um, as robustly and as systematically as we would have liked, but we heard at least kind of anecdotally from our participants that they were concerned about noise, they were concerned about um, electricity costs. As well, the efficiency or the, the effectiveness of the air cleaner probably went down. We didn't change the filter, so this is the cha same filter being used for the whole duration of pregnancy. And so some of it was sort of real changes in effectiveness, and some of it was probably changes um, in behavior as people sort of got sick of using these things, turned them off, particularly the units in the bedroom because of concerns about noise. Um, Given, though, that the, the, the exposure reductions were relatively modest, we have seen what I think are pretty, some pretty interesting um, differences in health between the intervention and the control group. And again, this is work that um, was led by students and postdocs um, who are the first authors on all these papers, so Prabhjit Barn, um, Sukhpreet Tamana, and Betsetsa Gulziku. Um, so we found kind of surprisingly, actually, didn't really anticipate looking at this, but it kind of popped out of the data. We actually found that the intervention group had lower odds of spontaneous abortion, so that's a pregnancy loss in the first 20 weeks of pregnancy. Um, increase in mean term birth weight of about 85 grams, um, so that's not a huge effect, but it's potentially meaningful. We saw some evidence of changes in kind of cardiometabolic outcomes, so things like indicators of like um, adiposity, um, so things like uh, body mass index, and then something called catch-up growth, which is basically where a baby's born small and then kind of, it kind of grows more rapidly than um, babies that were born at a more appropriate size. Um, and probably the most interesting finding, in, in my opinion, is at four years of age, we um, administered kind of a battery of tests and um, estimated full-scale IQ, and the intervention group had a mean full-scale IQ that was about three points higher than the control group. So this is kind of suggesting that reducing exposure during pregnancy may have benefits that linger um, into childhood, and as I said, we're continuing to observe these kids. They're now about eight years old, and we're repeating some of these measurements, trying to see if some of these things are starting to be sort of locked in as these kids um, age. The last point I'll make is that on the IQ result, we found greater benefits among kids whose mothers didn't take vitamins, experienced more stress, and had lower education. The details there aren't really that important, and I don't really want you to kind of focus on that. I only mention it because um, it suggests that um, the, the benefits of, of, of air filtration are probably not going to be evenly distributed. There are going to be some people who benefit more and some people benefit, who benefit less, and that's something we're going to have to think about as we start to think about these potentially as broader kind of public health interventions. Okay, so a little bit on um, drawbacks. Um, so I've kind of divided these into above the line as more sort of big picture societal issues and below the line as more sort of things that might affect a family that's using these kind of air cleaners. 
So I encounter this criticism a lot of sh kind of shifting responsibility. People are sort of a little bit uncomfortable. I've, I've, I've gathered over, over the years, people are a little bit uncomfortable, for example, with the work that we're doing in Mongolia, because I think there's a sense that by, by using air cleaners, we're kind of sh downloading responsibility for air quality uh, management and, and mitigation of health risks from governments to individuals. And people are a little bit uncomfortable with that idea. Um, it also assume if, if we're kind of encouraging people to use air cleaners, um, we're kind of um, assuming that they have stable housing, right? Telling people to close their windows and use an air cleaner doesn't really work if people don't know where they're going to sleep that night. So those are sort of bigger issues. And then in terms of doubt drawbacks for people that might use these air cleaners, there's this cold draft phenomenon. Most of these things are pulling in air from the bottom and blowing up air out of the top. So they're pulling the cold air off your floor and circling, cir circulating it around the room. And some of the studies that we've been involved in, participants have complained that it makes the room feel colder. I really haven't talked about gases. Um, you can get um, activated carbon or other kind of sorbent um, filters that will filter out some gases. But most of these devices, when you pull them off the shelf, are really kind of built to filter particles. Uh, more than gases. Uh, noise is an issue, um, and the bigger the unit, the more air it's pulling through, the more noise it's going to make. And then cost is obviously an important issue. So there's the purchase cost, the electricity cost, and then the cost of the replacement filters. So on the issue of cost, I just want to briefly talk about DIY air cleaners. Um, this has become a bigger issue. These got a lot more attention during COVID. Um, kind of in the earlier days of these things, a lot of them were just kind of a, a filter strapped to or taped to a box fan. Um, they've gotten kind of more elaborate as time has gone on. Gone on. This is the now famous Corsi Rosenthal um, filter, which is four MERV 16 filters with a box fan uh, taped on top of them. And there are lots of um, places online where you can get detailed recommendations on how to uh, put these things together. But in terms of their effectiveness, there's a very nice report that came out from the National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health recently. Um, and I really don't have a lot to say beyond what's in this report. It's, it's very, a very nice report, very informative. Um, these things are cheaper when you look uh, at cost um, per uh, CFM of, of clean air delivery rate. In some cases, even like an order of magnitude cheaper. And you do seem to get similar PM 2.5 reductions to the um, commercial air cleaners. There was a lot of concern initially about these DIY air cleaners posing a fire or burn risk. I heard that a lot, that you, know, you shouldn't use these things because they're going to catch on fire. That seems to have been a little bit overblown. And I have a citation at the bottom of a report, a uh, third party um, organization that the EPA apparently hired to evaluate the fire risk of these things. And that report's pretty reassuring in terms of it being a, a pretty low risk of fire or burns. That, that all said, there's little direct evidence of health benefits. We can kind of infer there might be health benefits if they're reducing PM 2.5, and we know PM 2.5 is bad from health, bad for health. We might kind of infer that there are health benefits, but there's really no direct evidence of health benefits from DIY air cleaners. And then last thing I want to say is about cost effectiveness, and I'm not an economist, so I'm way out of my depth here, but I at least want to mention this. Um, this is sort of related to this question that appears in this Washington Post uh, headline from a few years ago. When, will, when wildfire smoke invades, who should pay to clean the indoor air? And I think this is a question that we kind of collectively are going to have to struggle with um, uh, for the foreseeable future. And I wasn't going to include this uh, study because, I, as I said, I'm not uh, an economist. But then I found out Chris was chairing the session. And he's the senior author on this paper. So if you have any hard questions, you can ask uh, Chris about this paper. Um, but I think this is cool. There's been several efforts to kind of model the cost effectiveness of, the, of, of air cleaners as kind of a broad public health intervention. I think this one is, is pretty well done and is also relevant to all of us um, in BC. So they modeled the continuous use of a $150 portable HEPA filter air cleaner over five years in the province by people with an asthma diagnosis. And they estimated costs and benefits at the um, HSDA level. And they found that the, the full rebate, sort of full rebate for the full cost of the air cleaner, was effective in, in the HSDA that was most smoke impacted. But that a $100 rebate, or like two thirds of the cost of the air cleaner, was a, was a, was a cost effective intervention in most, most of the health service delivery areas. And they comment that a program should be implemented for HEPA filter air cleaners to mitigate the impacts of extreme wildfire events in places with recurrently high wildfire smoke exposure. So I, again, not an economist, but I just want to mention that because I think this is an issue that we're going to have to think about uh, moving forward. So uh, summarize, um, I think the priority should always be to reduce emissions whenever we can. 
um, with air filtration as a supplementary measure, but the kind of elephant in the room is that with wildfire smoke, we really can't um, reduce emissions directly. Um, there's pretty strong evidence that HEPA filter air cleaners reduce PM2.5 concentrations by roughly 50% on average, with a lot of vari variation around that average, um, with pretty similar effectiveness, it appears, for DIY air cleaners. Um, the evidence of health is not quite as strong, but some evidence of both respiratory and cardiovascular benefits from short-term use of these things. We really don't know much at this point about the health benefits of DIY air cleaners. And I would say at this point we know very little about the benefits of use over long durations and the impacts on more sort of clinical outcomes um, as opposed to the sort of preclinical outcomes that I mentioned earlier. And that's all I want to say. Thanks for listening. And there's my email address if you want to contact me, and I'm happy to answer questions. All right. Beautiful talk. So I take it from what you said in Mongolia that you're recommending more stress and less education, right? Yeah, I may have said that. <laughs> no, 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 I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's a joke. It's okay. a joke. I, may have, I was going to say, I may have said that wrong. No, stress, you stress is bad. You said it perfectly right. Stress it is was, bad. I'm just trying to lighten the mood okay. a little bit. It's all good. Okay. Um, I will say, though, that I, I act, this is not a joke. I like the noise of my HEPA filter as white noise. I love it, actually. I turn it on practically as much for that reason as anything yeah. else. But maybe that's a newer one, or I don't know. Uh, I don't know. We have one. I love it, too, but I think some people hate it. I think yeah, it depends yeah. on your... Okay, uh, question, sir. Thanks, uh, Jason Emmert, Metro Vancouver. Uh, can you, has there been any studies that looks at comparing the kind of whole building HVAC system, um, you know, HEPA filter, MERV filters, uh, in in the context of of the, the studies that you were referring to, um, you know, the, the difference between the concentrations and the exposure and whether having more whole building or whole house uh, um, filtration kind of closes that gap between, between the concentrations and the exposure, given that there is such a kind of a difference between that with the, with the portable hair. Yeah, filters. there may have been. I'm not, nothing is... Um coming to mind. I'm really bad at thinking of specific studies when I'm standing in front of a room of people, but um, there may have been. I, I can't think of any, but uh, my sense is that like that, that phenomenon I talked about where the personal exposure reductions are much smaller than the concentration reductions, I think that's really driven more by time spent kind of completely outside of the dwelling, right? Um, if, it's, if, it's a, if it's a reasonably sized unit, I mean, unless you live in some like enormous mansion or something, if it's a reasonably sized unit, the, re the ex concentration reductions are going to be sort of most pronounced in that room, but you're probably going to get some benefits throughout the whole space. I think that phenomenon is really driven by like when you go to work or when you go to school, more than kind of variations within the dwelling. That said, I mean, I think you're right that one of the, one of the advantages of kind of HVAC filtration and one of the downsides of portable filters is with HVAC you do theoretically at least get kind of broader benefits in bigger spaces, whereas the air cleaner, the, the benefits are more localized. But I think it's really more about kind of time spent elsewhere. Mike's got a question. I didn't see that. Go ahead. Just really quick. Um, were most of the studies were the air cleaners in the bedroom, and would you say that's a general recommendation of the place to put the portable? Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's been super great consistency from study to study. I think some are kind of in, they call like the main living space or the living room, kind of wherever the TV is usually, and then some are um, in the bedroom. I think there's a trade-off. Like, like one of the things we noticed in Mongolia, I think there's a trade-off. I it's sort of theoretically the bedroom would be the best place because that's where you're spending eight hours of your day, right? But I think that's also the place where the sensitive sleepers are more likely to turn it off. And so I think a unit that is on is going to be more beneficial no matter where it is than a unit that gets turned off. So I think there's a trade-off there. All things equal, you'd want it in the bedroom. But if they're going to turn off the bedroom unit, which is what we saw a lot of people doing in Mongolia, I think the living room unit's probably better because then at least it stays on the whole time. So... Dirt, dirt, 
Yeah, so it varies. The answer is it varies a lot. Um, so the question was how long does it take an air cleaner to kind of clean up the room? And it, it varies a lot, but it's really largely a function of um, how much air is being pulled through either the HVAC filter or the portable air filter relative to the volume of air that you need to clean. So if you're in a big, huge room and you have a small air cleaner, it's going to take a long time. If you're in a smaller space, you have a big air cleaner, it could be a matter of, of, um, of minutes. Um, yeah. 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 Um, well, how dirty is the air kind of depends on what else is happening, like if it's a wildfire or whatever. But I think the answer is that if you turn that thing on, the air is going to get, and it's, it's sort of appropriately sized for that space, probably within, I would guess, kind of 15, 30 minutes, you're going you're, you're to have much cleaner air. This question, I might, might even ask one after that, just because I think we're close enough on time that this is an important discussion. So why don't you go ahead? <laughs> I'd just like to ask, are there plans to include other filtration technologies? Because you mentioned HEPA, there's a lot of companies who claim to be HEPA-like, or you have the molecule who says they have a PICO technology, Intel appear that has a DFS technology. I think HEPA is you know, it's been around for a long time. Is there plans to include other filtration technologies that we see now are claiming to be better than HEPA? To include in the research? research. Or, or do you know of any other research or studies that are looking into those? Yeah, there's, there's, been, um, there's been some work, not sort of at all the ones you listed, but there's certainly been some work that I didn't really talk about on like electrostatic precipitators, on ion, gen um, ion generators, some other technologies. And I'm, I'm not, I want to be clear, I'm not an expert on kind of all all the um, air cleaner technologies. I do know there's some concerns with some of those technologies, although about even you may be pulling out particles out of the air, but you may be putting other things into the air. So um, there's one study I'm familiar with in China where they looked at um, ion generators and they actually found that they increased ozone concentrations. So there are trade-offs there. Um, Dr. Nazarov can probably say more about this than I can. I see him nodding his head, so I must be not too far off. Um, Okay. So yeah, I think that's the concern there partly is that, and I'm not sure I believe that they're better than HEPA filters necessarily. I mean, I think one of the reasons HEPA filters are so widely used is that they, they work pretty well. Um, so there are, but there are trade-offs in terms of what you're pulling out of the air and what you're putting back in, I think. Yeah, and the, the precipitators will also increase NOx, I believe. Um, but yeah, I think uh, in SEMA, we'll just have one more question, but I think kind of going around 15 minutes over, we'll work with the whole scheme of things. But I, it kind of ties to the last question. I was going to ask you about, there's this whole other literature about stove replacement and clean stoves and, and all of that in that similar type of environment, Mongolia, et cetera. Tell me what you think about this. Your, your, your summary seems to show a little bit of a better, that, that whole literature has generally been negative and sort of vastly disappointing, I mean, with lots of caveats. But overall, it's been frustratingly overall disappointing, I guess, if you want to put it that way. I could interpret your your summary as a bit a bit more positive. So I guess I'm wondering, do you agree that overall the HEPA filter literature in roughly similar environments is somewhat more encouraging? If so, why? I mean, I think I know that we're over time, but I think this is a really important thing because this in the in the big picture literature, this is a massive uh, effort to look at clean stoves, and then there's this whole other effort to look at HEPA. And I'm kind of wondering what you think about the comparison. Uh, so really, really quick, uh, I think a couple of comments. One is, I'm not sure I'd be quite as negative on the stove literature as you. I mean, it hasn't been overwhelming, but like certainly like Kirk Smith's Respire trial showed some benefits around pneumonia and that sort of thing. And I, so I think that's one difference is that those studies, a lot of them have looked at kind of arguably more meaningful outcomes. We're looking at these really subtle changes, really subtle kind of 
preclinical indicators where it's maybe easier to see effects. So I think that might be part of it. The other thing is I think a stove change in many ways is a heavier lift because that is more um, you're starting to mess with people's kind of cultural practices around how they cook. Whereas an air cleaner, as long as people can tolerate the noise, you basically plug it in and go on with your life. So I think in terms of kind of the behavioral aspects of it, an air cleaner is in many ways a much easier intervention to implement than a stove. So those are kind of my quick thoughts on that. Oh, great. Uh, sorry, Eric. I, well, I mean, I guess I'd be hypocritical to say that I won't go over time and then uh, do it myself. But you want to make a quick comment, I guess? Yeah, comment, but, like, uh, another reason why, like, it's all cleaning the air. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's effectively cleaning the air where, I mean, it's effectively cleaning the air, whereas, like, the stove, um, you're trying to Im reduce an emission source. Um, so I think... Which There's, is theoretically better, though, right? In theory. It, I mean, based on your beautiful chain of events, in theory. Yeah. Theoretically, the stove switch out would be better, but. There's the, there's the issue of outdoor air pollution and natural ventilation, which is used in a lot of these places, maybe not Mongolia because it's cold, um, but outdoor air pollution is, is infiltrating, so the, the filter is cleaning also the outdoor air pollution. The stove interventions don't do anything with the outdoor air pollution I get problem. That. I get that. No, I like, I like these. Uh, this, is, this is the best part of, of these days, I think, is these discussions. So let's continue them. Uh, we have one more talk, however. Um, thank you very much, Ryan.